can you uh, break down how uh, uh, ESG uh, was sold, meaning why did some people think this was a good idea, and why do you think it's not a good idea? So, so the origin story of the modern version of it starts with the 2008 financial crisis. Okay, what happened in the 08 crisis? Actually, there's two things that happened in 08 that were really interesting in the back of the 2008 financial crisis. One was a mistake made by the Republican Party, which was to bail out the big banks. That was, I remind you, Hank Paulson, an alumnus mm-hmm. of Goldman Sachs, who used taxpayer money to bail out Goldman Sachs under President Bush. That happened. And what happened in response to that was you had a left-wing backlash. By the way, I think that was crony capitalism all the way down. I was a critic of it at the time. I remain a critic of it today. There was a left-wing backlash that said, you know what, if that's the way you're going to behave, then we, Occupy Wall Street, want to take money from all of those wealthy corporate fat cats and bankers and redistribute it to poor people to help poor people. Mm-hmm. Agree or not, that is what they had to say. It was a coherent, it was a coherent response, if you ask me. Mm-hmm. Now, Right around that time, a second trend was happening in, in sort of the political, socio-political life of our country. Barack Obama was elected as president of the United States. There was the birth of a new strand of the left. So not the Occupy Wall Street left, but a new strand of the left that said, mm, you know what? It's not quite economic injustice or poverty that we care about. Not just that. There's, there's the real problem that has to do with racism and misogyny and bigotry and climate change. That's a become a big one. The biggest now. one. Yes, the man. biggest biggest, yeah. biggest one of all, right? I, mean, I, I think wokeism is one religion. Climatism is a religion that dwarfs wokeism by comparison. Mm. But, but anyway, they said this is, this is the sort of the new theory of the case. And what happened was that this was the opportunity of a generation for big business in this country, for Wall Street in particular. Because if you're Wall Street, Occupy Wall Street, it's a pretty tough pill to swallow, bitter medicine, okay? Right. The new woke stuff is pretty easy. You applaud diversity and inclusion, put some token minorities on your executive ranks or your boards or whatever, muse about the racially disparate impact of climate change after you fly on that private jet Mm -hmm. in Davos. It's good work if you can get it, but they didn't do it for free. And that's what this whole ESG stakeholder capitalism thing is about. They made a new demand to the new left that says you look the other way when it comes to leaving our corporate power intact. And so it's this sort of arranged marriage, actually. My parents are from India. They had an arranged marriage. That, uh-huh. that was the good kind. You're like, like I know kind. it all too familiar. Yeah. I get it. I mean, there's, there's. I, I didn't mean to like use that term yeah. in a negative sense. They had a good kind of arranged marriage. But this, this is, this is not an arranged marriage of love. Okay, this is, this is mutual prostitution. Each side gets something out of the trade, and the net result of that, the bastard child, was the birth of this ESG movement, the ESG industrial complex, this apologist model of capitalism, that says you have to advance these progressive agendas as a way of atoning for your sin in the 2008 financial crisis, but even more as a way of, if you can't beat them, buy them. And that's effectively the mutual codependent relationship between a progressive movement that used to hate big business, but instead got in bed with them. And together, you know, big banks, woke millennials get in bed, they birth woke capitalism, and they use that to sacrifice Occupy Wall Street, which they put up for adoption. So anyway, that's a little bit of the history of this game. What, why am I upset about it? Yes, Milton Friedman correctly said that this would make businesses less efficient and they would be less good at making widgets and then that shrinks the size of the economic pie and we're all worse off. And we all know that old school conservative, classical conservative, neo-libertarian argument. I, I actually agree with most of it, by the way. But that's not what gets me going on this issue, okay? My concern was not that politics would infect capitalism, not just that, but that capitalism would infect democracy. Because what this worldview says is that the way you settle questions like climate change or systemic racism or whatever it might be is not the way we do it here in America, which is through free speech and open debate in the public square where every person's voice and vote counts equally. That was the bargain we struck in 1776. For better or worse, that's how we do it over here. But that we got to go back to doing it the way they used to do in the old world. Back in old world aristocratic Europe, where a small group of business elites and labor elites and church elites got together behind closed doors and decided what was right for the rest of society at large. And that's why I I sort of try to educate people. This is not a Republican versus Democrat 2022 or 2023 issue. This is a 1776 issue, and it's a question of how you settle disagreements in a society. Is it as citizens with an equal voice through a democratic process? 
or is it through some type of aristocratic monarchical structure where some guy named Larry Fink sitting on Park Avenue gets to use your money to tell you what kind of society he will create, even if it's one you didn't vote for. So I was watching this documentary. It's like a 19-minute documentary Bloomberg did. I don't know if you've seen it or not, where they're telling a love story. It's, it's, a, it's a different story than the one you're talking about. And they're telling a story about Robert Schwartz. If you can pull up Robert Schwartz and Robert Zevin, just type in Robert Schwartz and Robert Zevin to just do the name. Don't even worry about the documentary. Just do Robert Schwartz right there, and let's see what comes up. Uh, 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 underneath Robert Schwartz, just write ESG. Right next to Robert Schwartz, write ESG. Let's see what pulls up. So there is a... Uh, what was the second name? Zevin? Uh, it's that one right there. He died in 2006. That Wikipedia right there, go down. That one right there. Yeah, zoom in. Zoom in. So this is... Uh, he was a U.S.-born economist and a stockbroker. He was an early advocate of socially responsible investing. He was also actively campaigned for civil rights uh, against the Vietnam War, the use of nuclear weapons. He actively participated in organizations such as American Veterans Committee, Americans for Democratic uh, Action, saying in 1989 he founded uh, econ Economists Against the Arms Race, now called Economists for Peace and Security. So the story says how these guys originally felt capitalism was a problem and the right way of doing it is to force businesses to be socially uh, uh, conscious of what they're doing to keep mon uh, give money back. Obviously, they're very left on what they're doing. So the story was, there, you know, this is uh, uh, $30 trillion of money being invested back into, the, into people, $35 trillion being invested back into the world that we live in. And it, again, it sounds very convincing, okay, where a lot of people are falling for it. I remember when we were selling our insurance company uh, and we were going with uh, – Folks at Hulahan Loki and we're sitting with buyers. Okay, you know the okay. process. You've gone through this yeah, before. Course. And so we're sitting down. It's like, oh, so tell us your, uh, I'm like, so what does your company look like? Well, our hardest, ch biggest challenge we have is we have a 1,000 investment bankers that work with us, but uh, uh, only 5% are African Americans, 6% are uh, Hispanics, and we're really having a hard time with that. I said, oh, really? I said, you know, our DI score is this and this, this, that. And they're asking about the DI score, right? I said, okay, yeah. You know, we're 54% Hispanic. You know, we're 51% women. And, you know, the average agent is 34 years old. And you see, like, their faces. The, the, the lighting their up faces probably. is like, oh, this could, uh, this is, so you guys have a very, so, and then they started talking, you know, uh, 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 how this could impact their DI score. The look on their face, they were more interested on what this is going to do, their DI score in the marketplace. That's right. Than the investment. Oh, of course, which and this was is completely supplied. Yeah. It's a different kind of scoring system, right? right? I mean, it's like ESG scores go into your credit rating. That affects whether or not you can borrow more expensive right. or not, right? So, so a couple things going on here. Okay, so first there was this socially responsible investing movement, and you described it perfectly. That exactly was the goal: use capital as a lever to drive positive social change, or what someone would determine as positive social change. The question they skip is. Who gets to decide what is positive or not? If these are contested public mm -hmm. policy issues, right. that means they're contested because people, human beings, citizens disagree about it. And we have to decide what's the way we work out our differences. Is it through force, including economic force, or is it through a process of debate in a democratic body politic? I thought we lived in the latter. Old world Europe, and actually in fairness, by the way, I just want to say something to be fair about this. For most of human history, that's not how it's been settled. Okay, right. this is a relatively new idea. I mean, it existed in ancient Greece in some sense, but in modern history, this is a relatively new idea. You actually have most questions that were settled through force, either physical force or through other elite intervention. So this American thing we got going on here, this is a departure from history, but that's the experiment that I signed up for, or at least my parents signed up for. I signed up for by being born here. My parents signed up for by coming here. That was the American way. And so to me, that's the first question is who gets to decide what the right answers are. But the second thing is what's going on with ESG right now is different. That is to say it goes beyond what was going on with the sustainable or the socially responsible investing SRI movement. So there, what they were doing was saying – and by the way, when I was a student at Harvard, the endowment at Harvard, you know, some people $60 joke. $60 billion. You know, yeah. Some people joke around that Harvard is a giant hedge fund with a college attached sure, to it. correct. Right? So – what they would do is they would kind of use their capital to divest from Sudan or di divest from conflict areas and then take a lot of credit for it and issue nice press releases. That was what socially responsible investing was about mostly is divestment. Okay, take the bad sectors, 
pick whatever you think is bad. Tobacco, coal, oil, Sudan, cigar- you know, whatever, gaming. Mm-hmm. Firearms is a big one. Divest. And then hopefully if you divest, that will then cause those companies to change their behavior. What ended up really happening was that we have deep, liquid global capital markets. So if those stock prices go down, for example, or asset prices go down, the inherent worth of the activity, the commercial value of it hasn't changed. That just created an opportunity for somebody else to buy it up instead. And so what ended up happening is the guys who want to issue the press releases end up giving up return. The guys who don't care about the press releases would rather stay anonymous end up being the other side of that trade. They just get to buy it at a lower price. And that's why UT's University of Texas's system has outperformed Harvard's endowment because Harvard got out of fossil fuels while the University of Texas didn't over the course of 2022. Mm-hmm. So what the ESG movement does is one step goes one step further than that. And this is where I'm focused, okay? BlackRock, State Street, Vanguard, these are three of the largest financial institutions. They manage about $20 trillion, almost as much capital as the U.S. GDP in the hands of three institutions. Mm -hmm. But what they're mostly doing isn't just the socially responsible investing thing through their ESG funds. It's a common misconception. That's a tiny, tiny, tiny part of what they do, like less than 2% or something, okay? Most of what they do is they're actually just providing index funds to the general population, people who think they own the S&P 500. Mm-hmm. who think they own Apple and Nike and, and you know, whatever, you name the company, Exxon, Chevron, et cetera. But the key is they're not divesting through those funds. They're investing in the whole market. In fact, who are the top shareholders of Disney and Paramount Pictures, of Apple and Microsoft, of Exxon and Chevron? It's the same companies. <laughs> Actually, it's the same large shareholders are the institutions that hold these firms. They're using the money of everyday citizens to do it, but they're changing the behaviors of those underlying companies by voting their shares and by advocating for policies in the boardroom that change the companies themselves. So here it's not divesting from Apple because they didn't do a racial equity audit. It's being invested in Apple and making Apple do a racial equity audit at their company last year that Apple itself did not want to do. Apple's board said, absolutely not. BlackRock and State Street said, "Um, actually, you're going to do it because we're your shareholders and we're the ones that demand it. Now, the funny part is, It's not like Larry Fink or BlackRock is the actual shareholder. It's probably most listeners to this program whose money is invested in their funds but don't know that their money is being voted in this direction. So that's the key with the the main – where the main action is on the ESG debate isn't the divestment game. Yeah. It's the voting game. So if you like this clip and you want to watch another one, click right here. And if you want to watch the entire podcast, click right here.